Nowadays, and for a few decades now, the idea of liberation, that is freedom from tyranny, and of indulgence in whatever urge or whim, seems to have been walking hand in hand. My view on this is that the system is now living under the rule of Dionysus, the god of debauchery and intoxication, who in the meantime overthrew the stern Zeus as a personality. The grouping of these two ideas is done on purpose and is a very important to understand ruse played on our psyches. It is being sold on every propaganda medium, this idea that tyranny is that which oppresses what is called free will, and that freedom is that which allows that free will to manifest in repeated action, especially if it pays taxes or generates revenue in any other way. So what is also presented as free will is freedom to indulge, be it in fantasy, which is denial of reality circumstance that generates fantasies within fantasies and trapping further, be it in excessive emotional responses, which plays down the importance of self-alchemy and analysis of one's emotions, be it in overindulgence in any activity, which promotes addiction, and so on. So the system has players in two roles. On the one hand, someone plays the oppressor of indulgence. For example, priesthood religion forbidding any contact with such indulgences. The prohibition merely generates an accumulating unconscious steam pocket. And so on the other hand, someone plays the liberator for indulgence. For example, New Age religions that promote the cult of identification with one's wishes, promoting the idea that the meaning of life is to be happy, which actually means for them to try to satisfy the ego identification. The answer lies in the middle, in between, and they know it. However, the system's willing and knowing players, as stated in a previous video, the sensation addicts, love it here, and especially love the positions of relative power within the game that are given to them as rewards, so that they can freely indulge. They know that there is no freedom in indulgence, in the same manner that they know that complete abstinence does not lead to freedom, because it victimizes the ego even further. It is my view, also stated previously, that ego is not an enemy in our way, but the worst suffering victim, caught in a confusing battle it knows nothing about. The ego needs indulgence, in the proper measure, as it also needs discipline and to trust a higher entity. The idea is that this higher entity is the connection to truth beyond the veil. And it involves trust on the part of the ego, because the ego cannot see anything beyond reality. This is actually the correct application of faith, in my opinion. If the connection to truth does not become the higher entity that the ego trusts in, remember that connection to truth speaks no words, then the ego becomes vulnerable to having surrogate masters, so to speak, which can be an overindulgence that becomes an addiction, as stated in the previous contemplation on addictions, or worse, either another ego who can manipulate at will, or even itself as a master, as it worships the identification with the ego, potentially severing the connection to truth. How many of us have witnessed the egomaniac disguised as a spiritual seeker, who actually cares for nothing but his own ego needs, and also the manipulative gurus who had a few realizations and then used them to manipulate other vulnerable egos around them and, and score themselves some cougars? And ladies, this does not apply only to men, okay? Indulgence is not liberation, much less freedom. The whole point of realization is to have the ego let go of something that was in the way of a part of its own connection to truth. The more connected to truth and the more the ego trusts this connection, the more it will self-reflect, self-observe and the least it will actually need or have urge to. It is not that it won't need or enjoy indulgence. 
It is perfectly healthy for the ego to be able to savor pleasure. But only as long as the ego's relationship with that indulgence is not conducive to addiction and sensual identification. If one is a, a, an alcoholic, the best is to be separated uh, from contact with any kind of alcoholic uh, beverage to start with. However, that is not the end goal of healing alcoholism. The end goal of healing is to be able to drink alcoholic beverages again and not become addicted anymore because there is only healthy indulgence together with discipline and an ego's faith in a connection to truth that it cannot see, that speaks no words, that doesn't become anything else, and yet clearly shows him miracles at every turn. One must understand that the ego has needs to be happy, but it also needs to perform his function within the psyche, and to do that it needs to clear up space in itself that is nefarious or unnecessary, and also to trust and maintain a connection to truth, as its higher entity. The ego is programmed to look for this connection. It is not its fault that it was created this way. If it is not established within its own truth ray, then it will surely be established with any of the myriad of falsehoods available, which will only make him a victim. Treat your ego kindly, as one would treat a pet kindly, and understand its needs, but also teach it discipline. It will love the discipline in which all things can be enjoyed and can be endured within measure, far more than any kind of complete abandonment into sensual gratifications or into addictions to suffering. The latter is also very common, as we can see more and more ego-identified people always looking for the exact situations that they know will always bring the same painful result. It is an addiction to victimhood. The system needs its prisoners, so it tries in any way possible to keep them locked in. And we all have one such prisoner inside, abandoned in a world where everything looks so definitive. It is up to our higher conscious, who has realized that this world is anything but definitive, to be understanding, loving, but also balancing it with an unwavering discipline towards it, at the right moments. Better a few instants of disappointment than a whole lifetime of abandonment and never ceasing suffering. After all, the ego always exaggerates. Come on, whose dog hasn't come up with that look as if saying, I haven't eaten in years, just two hours after the last meal. So in the same manner, our relationship with others' egos should follow the same principles, in my view. That is, it should be understanding but firm, attentive but unattached, light-hearted but serious and sober. Without the weight of too much expectation, nor the sloppiness of too little, our relationships, be them casual, working, friendship or marital, become simpler, more sincere and less emotional. Consequently, less prone to attachment. In any case, the important point to contemplate on this is that neither the negation of nor the indulgence in the senses are appropriate paths towards truth. Both of these deny the circumstance. Negation of any sensual activity denies the existence of an ego with programmed needs, the fact that the higher conscious knows the ego is a construct made up of agglomer agglomerates does not mean that it should be voluntarily subject to complete deprivation and pain. And indulgence in all desired sensual activity denies not only the false nature of reality, but also the proneness to addiction that the, and the long-run dissolution of any habituated sensation, which, after a while, becomes insufficient and needs escalation to remain sated. Denial of circumstance always leads to prolonged suffering and falsehood.
It is always through observation of what the constructs are made of and what context they compose together that the removal of a formal subconscious weight can occur, thus giving room for a truth realization and consequent reconnection. I'll simplify. By making conscious the subconscious, usually emotional, value of a concept form in reality that is pleasing or displeasing, please refer to the alchemy contemplation if necessary, that value is removed making room which is then taken by the realization. In this case, having less is having more. So I will have to say that both the tyranny and the indulgence or liberation are two walls of the same prison. Neither are leading to freedom. We have a place in the joy of service, of immortal admiration in the joy of the exaltation brought about by sharing true life, in the freedom of being exactly who and what we are meant to be, no less. But first we must understand that less in the death of falsehood we are submerged in may very well be more in truth and life. Unlike the consideration of the blind god in John Milton's masterpiece Paradise Lost, as the fallen angel stated that to serve in heaven was to be reduced, while to be king in hell was to be ascended. Quite the opposite. We will not reach freedom while we keep seeking it, for seeking requires motion, and motion requires time, and time is nothing but death delayed. And yet we are unable to ever reach it unless we seek. <laughs> we may reach freedom when, while seeking it, we finally realize that in that act we have been running from freedom all along. While the archons, as we can call them, in our ego sought to survive, they fooled us. As we seek, we move, and while we move, they live and we sleep. Yet we, st we still need to seek acquiring conscious knowledge that is invaluable to provide the ego with great tools, so do not doubt and do seek, but also recognize when the moment arrives to stay your search for the truth and to allow truth to seek you. It is always trying to find its brethren, stranded, imprisoned in the abyss of this nightmare reality. Let truth find you, and once it does, witness then fully and in awe its miracles around you, disguised as mundane things. Just walk the middle path.